Hi, welcome to the Noise Pack. In this episode, we're going to take a look at this Fluke 789 that I picked up from eBay and showed up to about $100 or so as non-working, and I thought that's a pretty good deal. These things are still pretty expensive. It's a very good multimeter. I'll put the spec there on the screen for you to take a look at. It does also have a 250 ohm hard built-in resistor, as well as some current providing for loop testing and so on, and that's what this is a process meter, of course. Now, it's still a very good multimeter on its own, even if you don't need the current sourcing and syncing and simulation performance of it, and it does have an infrared port at the top, and you could add a wireless transceiver there that converts the infrared to some RF and you can connect it to your phone, and you can buy that module separately. It didn't come with it, but if we can fix it, and it might be worth investing in. It is really dirty. This time I haven't cleaned it up, but the actual calibration seal is still intact. So I don't think this has been taken apart. It doesn't have any batteries in it. So let's try and put some batteries in it and see what's wrong with it. It was listed as not powering on. The plastic screws and the battery compartment of this are actually not in terrible shape. I've seen some of these being completely destroyed, and that's because people try to use a really tiny screwdriver to take them apart. I just lose a back of, for example, a tweezer, and that works really well because you do want to have a very large surface area so you don't damage those. So are we going to have a huge battery leakage in here, or not terrible? There's definitely some leakage in there you can see. I think I just realized what's wrong with this, looking at this battery terminals. So yeah, there should be a tab from here going over, and that tab is broken. So the positive terminal of this battery is on this side. So you can imagine if you put a negative terminal of the battery, it will be flush with here, and it will not make contact with that. <laughs> and that could be the only problem this thing has. And yes, this is what we're dealing with. So no wonder this thing doesn't turn on because there's no battery connection. Well, this would be a good opportunity now to completely take it apart and we can clean the case also and see what we can do with that pin. And here's the main board, which very easily comes out as one piece. Now, these fuses are actually accessible without you having to take apart the entire instrument, which you saw when I opened the battery compartment, because all the other screws are self-tappers. So you certainly don't want to open this instrument more than this. The PCB does look a little aged. This is revision 7. So if you have a newer revision, you can share what that looks like on the inside. But it does have a very classic and good design that you would expect from Fluke, appropriate cutouts in the PCB. With the protected traces over there, you can see they're missing the the actual solder mask on top of them, which is what you need for low leakage traces. And on this side, some of the protection circuits are also visible. We have our high resistance value, one mega ohm over there. We have a one amp resistor here, our shunt there, precision resistor bank over there, few uh, protection circuits at the input. And this little one has a little crack in the casing, but that really doesn't do anything. It's not important. I'm sure it's going to work just fine. Very nice connections to the probes there as to be expected from Fluke, and we do have our connections from the buttons. Now this pad over here, there's a screw that goes through, it connects to this shield on this side, I'll remove it in a second if I can, and on the other side of that, there's something interesting, this exposed pad makes connection to this exposed pad over there, and this metallized surface of this plastic with the buttons on the other side. This is an interesting thing they've done, they must have figured out that they need some plating over here to create an extended shield over this area for whatever reason that must have been necessary, which is interesting to see. We have to take a look and see what's on the other side. Let's see if this comes off easily. I think it does. It's just held together by tabs on both sides. Don't want to touch the circuits too much, of course. Here we go. Some of the more analog circuitry here on this side. Some capacitors, additional capacitors over here. Looks like it, our data converter is right there. Some analog devices part. And then we have an NEC controller for the LCD. LCD does have the LEDs on this side for backlight, and it's a very classic design. The traces here look good on the range switch, so we don't have to do anything about that. I think the board is in excellent shape. We do have the IR transceivers here also on this side, as you can see, if this would focus. There we go. Looks really good. Some DC DC converters on that side, and you can see, like for example, these large devices. They don't really do that anymore in these packages in the modern ones, but this is a nice unit. Now, turning our attention to the broken tab, this is also a very classic flu thing where they basically create two tabs here which directly connect the PCB traces. This is really nice because it means there's no wires hanging around, it's just a compression fitted, and that's how the connection made, which is good. But unfortunately, this is a long, long piece of metal, it's in one piece. So the broken tab is some custom-made cut metal there, so we have to figure out a different way of fixing this because we can't just find another tab to replace it. So let me look around and see what we can do. And by the way, this calibration seal over here is just a button on the other side. Right, so we have the carbon button here, which basically just touches on two pads on this side and initiates the calibration. So technically, if you don't have a calibration sticker on the side of this unit, which one doesn't have, I think it might have just fallen off, you could take this apart, 
do the calibration and mess with it without ever breaking this seal. Something interesting. I thought this might be a screw underneath it, but no, it's just a button. So I decided to go with the spring route, and yeah, it's pretty good. I don't think it's going to come off any, anytime soon. So let's see if we can squeeze this now back into the case. Okay, I think it looks pretty good. We're going to put some batteries in it. I also clean it up, so I think that it is in much better shape. Let's hope it works. All right, here we go. Uh, not too bad. Look at that. It works. I mean, at least it turns on. There's a backlight too level as to be expected. Let's put some voltages on this. Let's do a few quick measurements. So right now we're on the millivolt range and we're directly connected to the HP 3245A. So let's set that to one millivolt. Let's see if we get a nice one millivolt measurement here. Oops, that's wrong. There we go. Look at that. One millivolt. Perfect. We can increase it by 100 microvolt. See if it measures that difference. And it does that without any issues. So it actually works quite nicely. Now we can go on the volt range. And we do see that last digit preserved there. So let's try one volt now. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. It's really, really in spec given how old this is. And of course, I just took it apart and put it back together. But it's clearly still well calibrated. There you go. 10 volts. <laughs> Works no problem. We're going to go on the high output on this instrument. It should multiply that by a factor of 10. <laughs> Look at that. 100 volts. No problem at all. We're going to try the 1,000 volts also, but the, the HP 3245A cannot do that. So we're going to have to use a different instrument for that. And here's the instrument measuring the RMS value, and that is, of course, also correct. We can increase that by a factor of 10 over here, and we can see that it does measure continuously correctly. Right now, the frequency is at 60 hertz. If I go, let's say, 200 hertz, what do we get? Yeah, we get a little bit of deviation, but that's normal. I think it is the AC measurement is also working. So the Fluke 789 has a really sensitive current measurement capability. This is only a 30 milliamp range, and it's fused, actually, so it's a very low current measurement. Let's try and put something really small. How about one microamp? So we're going to go under here. One exponent minus six. And look at that. That's our smallest digit over there. So it indeed seems to be doing it. Let's try two just to be on the safe side. Two exponent minus six. Look at that. That is really good. So it works really well. Here's one milliamp. And it does that without any issues. Three zeros. Very good. The HP 3245A is well calibrated. That's why I'm relying on it so much. And we can try 10 as well. 10. No problem. Look at that. 0. 9.999. It's a little bit deviation from where it should be, but I think it's working really well. So let's try the current source capability of this instrument, which is one of the features of the 789 process meter. So right now it's set to 0 milliamp, and you can see we're reading about 13 nanoamp here on the Keysight 3458 a so there's nothing there. Now you can go up to 100 microamp, Let's see what happens. It's really close to 100 microamps, 99.6, pretty good. Let's go to 1 milliamp. Let's see what we get at 1 milliamp. Let's stabilize. Wow, that's, that's pretty good. That's good. And we can go, let's say, 2 here. <laughs> that's almost perfect. There we go. Look at that. That is a lot of zeros. So let's say 12. There we go, 12.002. Pretty good. And here's 20. And that's pretty good as well. I think the max has a 24 milliamp. Yeah, so I think the current source is also working. And on this, on this other point over here, you get a whole bunch of different features. Right now, it's ramping. So you can see the current slowly ramping up on a display. And this is useful for measuring some of the loops that this is intended for. It also looks good. But we may as well try the 1000 volt, of course, on it. This is the QT2470. Complete teardown and review of this is available on the channel, of course. And we can also see how fast this thing auto ranges, because it's in auto range more than 1000 volts is at its maximum. Here we go. Not bad. There you go. And it's exactly 1000 volts. And the current going in there determines the input resistance. And that's, of course, also correct. So, yeah, it works pretty nicely. So Ilya from XDev is kindly calibrating my Fluke resistance standard box. So for now, we're going to use something else to measure the resistance here. This 0 0.2 ohm is when all of these are set to zero. So it's basically just internal resistance of everything connected. Now I can increase the resistance by 0.1 ohm using this, and we should be able to read that. Look at that. That's pretty good. So indeed, it is working at that range. We'll set this back to zero. And here's uh, one ohm at a time. That works. 10 ohm at a time, here's a 100 ohm, it's pretty quick actually, here's a kilo ohm, 10 kilo ohm, and 100 kilo ohm. If I go all the way here, that should be 
One mega ohm. Look at that. It's actually really good. I'm surprised how accurate everything is. And there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed this really quick look at the Fluke 789. It does have a whole bunch of other features. You can supply 24 volts to power a loop and so on. It's intended for very specific applications, but nonetheless very useful if you need also a very small amount of current sourcing from this can be used for just general electronic purpose. It doesn't have to be for its exact intended application. So I think it's a pretty good score considering that it had such a simple problem. Hopefully you still enjoyed this. I'll see you next time.